Hello, this is 1.4 Network Security Part 2. So we're doing identifying and preventing vulnerabilities. So in this section, we'll cover what's highlighted here. So penetration testing and so on. So penetration testing is where you hire someone or you perform some tests under a controlled environment, normally done by a qualified person. Um, you will have probably heard of black, white and grey ha hackers. And this is what uh, part of the white hat hacking as job. So a white hat hacker would be employed to try and hack into the system and then they would suggest improvements and find weaknesses etc and they would suggest ways to improve them. So that's what a white hat hacker does. Okay so they've got permission to do it, they've been authorised and they're getting paid to do it I'm assuming. A grey hat hacker is someone who doesn't have permission but they will do it. So not paid for by the company directly but what they're doing is they're going to try and say they're going to try and hack Sony but the idea of trying to hack Sony is not to steal stuff from Sony. They're going to hack Sony. Then they're going to contact Sony and say, look, I found a way to get into your system. Uh, can you give me some money, probably? Uh, and I will tell you how to fix it. So they're like trying, they're like sort of vigilante white hat hackers. But they're generally not trying to um, do anything malicious. But they sometimes will break the law because they're technically not being asked to do uh, what they're trying to do. So they will often break the law. A black hat hacker is your normal hacker. Someone who's basically trying to break in. Still uh, credit card information probably, or just destroy stuff for the sake of it, uh, whatever. But they're basically doing something bad, and they're obviously breaking the law um, in doing so. So one of the ways from uh, stopping malware, which is obviously software that um, is deliberately made to damage uh, a computer, um, is to come up with anti-malware software. So not very um, difficult. Uh, examples of malware, but we've done this before, are viruses, uh, worms, and Trojan horses. But a very quick recap is that a virus is a malicious piece of code that infects a file, normally an executable file. Uh, and so you need to sort of send that file to someone else and they run it to uh, get the virus. A worm can actually send itself. It doesn't need human interaction to send itself across the network. Uh, and a Trojan horse is basically a, um, uh, an application that looks like a game or something but in fact he's doing something dodgy in the background so it's got a dual purpose it's so not the same as a virus a lot of people get them confused but a trojan horse has been deliberately disguised like so they're going to make a game but also they've designed it to you know damage your system a virus actually infects a perfectly normal game with some bad code All right so another way to block things is a firewall why firewall does it, it, it puts a barrier between uh, networks, basically. So as information is coming in and out of the computer on this network, the firewall can look at this information and decide whether to block it or not. Examples could be if you were getting DDoS from a certain or DOS from a certain um, IP address, you're getting loads and loads and loads of connections. The firewall could say, right, well, you've had 20 connections and done nothing. I'm going to block that IP uh, from contacting you. So no longer will that be quite a problem. Uh, it still can be because the firewall's got a lot to do and it could uh, block that up if there's lots of them going on. But the point is that it, it, it will have some sort of a barrier. It could also block um, certain programs from accessing the internet. You could block certain countries coming in, in theory, um, although this isn't, you know, there's many ways around that. Um, but it is another level of security. Um, but there you go. So, user access levels. When you log into a system, it's also known as system access rights. Basically, you're at school. Students have certain access levels, so they might be able to print. They might be able to save their documents, but they can't install software, and they can't um, access the maybe the shared area. Or they can access it to read, but they can't write to it. They can't make changes. A teacher like me might be able to change user's password. I can access your documents. I can um, install software on the computer. But I... Um, uh, sorry, I can't install software on the computer here, sorry. Only the technicians can do that. But I can um, write to the um, shared area. So there are different access levels, and it would go up and up and up to the system administrator having the highest level. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. Passwords. Obviously, that's pretty obvious. Um, you know, the thing with passwords are what makes a strong password and why is a common question. So having more characters makes it long, more difficult for a brute force attack to, uh, to work. That's why having longer passwords are better. Um, and mixing capital letters and lowercase and numbers and symbol also because if you use more numbers and symbols, that's more things a brute force attack has got to try to gain access. If, if you're only using 26 letters and you've got two letters, that's 26 times 26 possibilities. If you add in symbols and uppercase and you get to like 80 uh, symbols you could use, that's 80 times 80. So every time you add a mixture of possibilities of capitals, lowercase numbers and symbols, then 
you are giving more options per letter, so therefore there's more time for a brute force attack to work. Right, so how do you protect the password? This is a common one kids are not amazing at. So one thing you can do is have a time gap between entering a password so that a computer couldn't try millions of tries per second. You could have even, even a couple of seconds would, would like make a big difference. Um, you can also lock it for like 30 seconds if there's a few incorrect attempts. This happens on your phone when my son gets my phone and randomly mashes the pin keys. It says you can't try again for you know, a couple of minutes. Um, you can limit the number of guesses before you lock the account. Um, you can force, now this is what common, common students make a bad thing here, is they say things like, so they get a question in the exam like, what can the network security manager do to ensure password security, or ensure that passwords are secure? Uh, and they will say things like, have long passwords. But really what you need to say is, force people to have long passwords. Force people to have password complexity, okay? Obviously you should encrypt your passwords and you should have reset policies, so every 30 days or something you're forced to change it, etc, etc. Um, and you can have two-factor authentication, which is where you basically need two ways to enter the system. So on your mobile phone, it might be you enter a PIN and then you've got your thumbprint. On the computer, it might be a login and it might send you an email or a text um, or anything like that. So that's two-factor. Normally you get that on very high-level things like banks, um, etc. But some really high-level games have it um, because, you know, the, the accounts are worth so much money. So obviously you can physically secure your network, so you can put your network server behind locked doors, windows, alarm it, have CCTV on, etc, have locks, maybe lock the laptops in place, or when you put a laptop down you clip it in. But these are things that you can do to physically prevent theft or people you know, accessing the stuff that you don't want to access, like you know, getting access to your system. You can physically stop them from getting access to it. Okay, these are the main ones, not really hard to work this out. Um, obviously you should encrypt all of your uh, data so that if it does get stolen it's going to be harder to decrypt as they won't have the key. Obviously if they've got enough time they might be able to brute force decrypt it but, but that still adds another layer of protection and, and it might give you enough time to tell your users to change their passwords or their contact their banks. So it's not always about they'll never get it but if you probably you often know you've been hacked so then you can um, you can tell all the people, right, we've got to change all our passwords, we've got to change all our accounts, we've got to lock all them down. You know? So if, you, then if they've encrypted the data, it's going to take them time to decrypt it. Um, the Caesar cipher is quite an easy encryption method where basically you just shift the letters over a certain number. So an A would become a C, or in this case of this example, a D, so, or an E. So an A becomes D, B becomes E. So basically the letters are shifted across um, and you can then... Um, decrypt the message so you might move them across here so we've received the message with a key and the key was three so we move it across by three and the a has become d and the b has become e um, a caesar cipher is quite well um, researched online but essentially you've got to understand that you shift every letter in the message along a certain number of the alphabet and then if you don't know what number it's theoretically harder to calculate obviously in the modern era this wouldn't work as any one with a brain could decrypt it this was used many years ago um, by Julius Caesar and people didn't understand encryption and there, also, there was many languages back then so they just assumed it was a different foreign language um, and didn't even understand that it was possibly encrypted um, so yeah so that's basically um, how the Caesar cipher works but there's many videos online about it so you can look it up there